So you're thinking of making some cabinets and you're wondering how to build the doors. Of course, there are loads of videos and articles and books on the subject, but many of them fail to find a balance between keeping things simple and making a door that will last. In this video, I'll show you how to make a flat paneled cabinet door with just a table saw. No special router bits, no expensive jigs. We're not even gonna use a dado set. You can do this with the saw you own right now, even if it's just a small benchtop saw. The video won't be that long, but don't rush through it because I'll share some really important tips along the way that are critical to success, but for some reason, a lot of videos either gloss over them or they even give wrong information. Let's begin with your choice of wood. If you're watching this video, I assume you don't have a jointer or a planer, so you'll be using boards that you buy off the shelf from a home center. I'll be using pine in this video because this is just a demonstration. I'm gonna to toss the door. I wouldn't use pine if I was making a door that I wanted to last, especially not the stuff you get at the home center. It's poorly dried, it's likely to warp over time, and it is not durable at all. Poplar's a better choice because home center poplar boards are usually of a higher grade, so they're more carefully dried. But poplar is still a little too soft, especially for kitchen cabinets that you want to last many years. If it's available to you within your budget, a hardwood like maple is an excellent choice for natural, stained, or painted doors. Oak's also a good choice, though its open pores make it less attractive if you're going to paint. It's important to choose straight, flat boards. You can cut around a few knots, but if you don't have a jointer or a planer, you can't flatten a warped board. So for this reason, take your time to pick them out, but also take care of your wood when you get it home. Try to use it immediately so it doesn't have time to warp because the moisture levels in your shop are probably different from where it was stored at the home center. At the very least, cut it into shorter pieces that are close to the length that you'll need and put them inside a plastic bag. That'll help keep your moisture levels consistent so the boards won't move that much until you use them. Now let's get your saw ready. This process that we're going to use won't require a lot of power. I'm using a contractor saw, but this could be done with a portable benchtop saw as well. I recommend though a saw with a riving knife option because many of the cuts we'll make can't be done with the blade guard in place. The riving knife replaces that metal strip on the back of your blade guard, that's the splitter, that protects you from kickback. If your saw doesn't have a riving knife option that can be put in place of the splitter when you remove the guard, I'll leave a link below to a video about homemade splitter inserts. If you'd like to learn more about your saw other than what we're about to do here in this project, for a limited time we have a free five lesson course at stumpynubs.com. We call it Table Saw Basics, but it's really comprehensive. It covers just about everything you need to know about your table saw. You're gonna learn a lot. So just go to stumpynubs.com and go to the Stumpy Nubs University section of the site. I admit that the process we're using would be easier with a dado set. But to keep this simple, I'm going to be working with a regular saw blade. However, not all regular saw blades are the same. Many people have general purpose blades. They have teeth that are all cut at an angle and so they leave kind of an inverted V shape at the bottom of the kerf. You could get by with that blade. But if you have access to a rip style blade with flat top teeth or at least a combination blade where every fifth tooth is ground flat across the top, that'll give you the best cuts for this type of joinery that we'll be creating. This is what we'll be making. It's a 16 by 20 flat panel door. It has an MDF center panel, which as we'll discuss, makes the door very strong and stable and it looks great when it's painted. If you don't wanna paint, you could replace the MDF panel with a veneered plywood panel and the techniques in this video will be totally the same. If you prefer a solid wood panel, it's a more complicated process, which we'll cover in a different video. The cabinet door is made up of horizontal running rails and vertical running styles. To keep track of that in your mind, remember, rails run horizontally like the rails in a fence. The styles overlap the ends of the rails because that looks better when you install the door and you're looking at it from the edge. That also means that the ends of the styles are cut off square but the ends of the rails have little tongues in them. The terms that I'm gonna use in this video are rails, styles, tongues, grooves, panel, and rabbits. All of these things can be made quickly and easily with a table saw. So let's head over there. 
All of my rails and styles are one and three quarter inch wide. So I'll rip my boards to that width. My door will have two styles that are each 20 inches long. It will also have two rails that are 12 and a half inches long, plus an extra half inch on each end for those tongues. Don't forget to account for those. That makes the total length of the rails 13 and a half inches. After everything's cut to length, we can begin with the grooves. They'll be a half inch deep, so I'll set my blade a half inch above the top of the saw. The grooves will also be a quarter inch wide, and I want them perfectly centered along the length of each style and rail. Now my saw blade is only an eighth of an inch thick. Yours may be even a little thinner, so I'll have to cut the grooves with multiple passes. I set the fence so the blade will cut as close to the center of my workpiece as I can judge by eye. It doesn't have to be perfect at this point, just as close as your eye can get it. Feather boards are optional, but I find they help me keep my work pieces tight against the fence as I cut. This is especially important if I'm feeding a lot of pieces through because I'm making a lot of doors. Notice I'm placing one ahead of the blade, close to me, and another one behind the blade, further away from me. Normally, you would not want a feather board behind the blade because the lateral pressure that it exerts may close your fresh cut kerf on the back of the saw blade and that could cause a kickback. But we'll be cutting, in this case, a shallow groove that doesn't go all the way through the workpiece. So this kerf can't be forced closed by the feather board, making this situation an exception to that rule. Push the workpiece through the cut, then rotate it 180 degrees so the opposite face is against the fence, and run it through again. Do this with all your workpieces, both your styles and your rails. Since your blade is likely not perfectly centered, that second pass slightly widened the kerf and it auto-centered it on the edge of the board. Of course, it's not yet wide enough, so move the fence a little bit closer to the blade, not too much, perhaps less than a sixteenth of an inch. If you're using feather boards, you'll have to adjust them as well. Then run your boards through again using the same cut-rotate-cut method, which will widen your kerf even further and keep it centered on the edge. Now measure how wide the kerf has become. If it's not yet a quarter inch, make another fence adjustment and repeat the process. Remember, each fence adjustment will be doubled because you're rotating and cutting twice. So its small adjustments are best. However, we're only shooting for about a quarter inch. It doesn't have to be precisely a quarter inch. If you overshoot and your groove is a little wide, that's fine. Once you have your quarter inch-ish groove in all the work pieces, set the styles aside. We're going to cut tongues on the ends of the rails now. Lay one rail next to your blade and adjust the blade height until it's just a hair below the groove. Now position your fence a half inch from the outer edge of the blade. Put your miter gauge in its slot and attach a scrap of wood as a sacrificial fence to it with its end almost touching the table saw's fence. Now find one of the off cuts that you had left over when you cut your rails and styles to length we're going to use that scrap to test our setup. Run the off cut over the blade, trimming the very end. Then take another pass and another, nibbling away the waste one kerf at a time until the end touches the fence. I also like to take some skim cuts by moving the piece sideways across the crown of the blade as I push it forward. That smooths everything out. It's not dangerous because you've removed virtually all the wood. You're just skimming the surface. This is especially useful if your blade doesn't have flat ground teeth. Skimming the top of the blade will even out the rippled surface that some general purpose blades leave behind. Now flip the workpiece and repeat the process, completing the other side of the tongue. Test the fit in one of your grooves. It's likely a little oversized, so raise your saw blade a tiny bit, remembering that any adjustment is doubled when you cut both sides of the tongue. Continue skimming little bits of material away until the tongue is the right thickness to fit well in the groove. If you overdo it and the fit's too loose, trim off the end and start again, thankful that you're using an offcut instead of your good workpiece. Once the fit's dialed in, cut tongues on both ends of each rail. With your styles and rails complete, it's time to make the center panel. Many videos online say to use a quarter inch center panel. But for a cabinet door, I prefer a half inch panel because the door is much less likely to warp over time. It's a real problem with quarter inch panels, especially with larger doors. Half inch MDF is a better choice in my opinion. 
Of course, MDF must be painted. If you intend to apply a clear finish to your door, you'll need plywood that's veneered with the same species as your styles and rails. So if you have maple styles and rails, you buy maple plywood. If you have oak, you buy oak and so on. Size your panel by measuring the opening in the assembled frame, then adding the depth of the grooves all the way around. So in this case, the height of my opening was 16 and a half inches, but I had to add two half inch grooves. So that gave me 17 and a half inches. The width amounts to 13 and a half inches after I add the two grooves to that. However, I like to make my panel slightly undersized because it makes assembly easier as you'll see later. So I'm going to make it just under 17 and a half by 13 and a half. Since a half inch thick panel will obviously not fit into a quarter inch groove, we must thin the edges by cutting a rabbit around all four sides. There are a lot of ways to do this on a table saw, but without a dado set, I think the easiest way is to just stand it up on edge. Set the blade a half inch above the table. Since your panel is a half inch thick, it makes a good depth gauge. Then set your fence so your first pass will just skim the outer surface of the panel as you run it on edge. You're going to do this on all four edges, rotating the panel as you go. Because the blade is not very high and the cuts are very light, it shouldn't be difficult to hold the panel perpendicular to the top of the saw as you cut. However, a featherboard stack such as this will make the job a little easier. After the first pass along all four edges, move your fence a bit closer to the blade, adjust the featherboards as needed, and repeat the passes on all four edges. Check the fit in your groove and make additional passes as needed, slowly thinning the edges of the panel until they fit in the grooves. Now MDF will swell a little bit when you apply glue, so you don't want a really tight fit, but you don't want it loose either because you'll be able to see gaps around the assembled panel. Speaking of assembly, let's put it together. Brush glue inside the grooves in both the rails and the styles. I also like to add a little extra to my tongues. Assemble the frame around the panel. By cutting that panel a little undersized, I left room for error and I ensured that my joints in the frame will go together tightly. Sometimes it's easy to get your panel just a teeny bit oversized and then you'll have gaps in your joints. Note that the rabbited side of the panel will be on the back of the door so that the front surface of the panel is inset a quarter inch on the show side. And that's all there is to it. This sturdy cabinet door will last many, many, many years. You may even buy some moldings from the home center that you can miter and set just on the MDF all the way around to give you a more complex, fancier look. As I said, MDF is stable and sturdy, as is plywood. Solid wood panels are more complicated. You can't glue them into the grooves. You have to leave room for wood movement. We'll cover that in a future video. When that's available, I'll put a link below. In the meantime, don't forget to check out that free table saw course over at StumpyDubs.com. We'll see you next time. It's just a couple of cuts. Your ears will be fine, right? They will be if you have your Isotunes Bluetooth earbuds in because you'd already have your ANSI certified hearing protection on because you're listening to your favorite music and podcasts. And you're supporting a small family business at the same time. Please use the link below this video to learn more and to show them you support what we do as well. Wait, don't go yet. If you're new here, please subscribe and remember to ring the bell. I would really appreciate that. Give us a thumbs up or better yet, leave us a comment. I always read them. And be sure to check out the latest issue of Stumpy Nubs Woodworking Journal. It's always packed with tips, tricks, and tutorials designed to make you a better woodworker.